Welcome to The Forest Garden, a podcast for gardeners who want to upgrade their landscapes into biodiverse food forest systems. Today, we'll be speaking with Dr. Tom Molnar about the hazelnut breeding program he directs at Rutgers University. These trees represent decades of germplasm collection, evaluation, and breeding research conducted by Tom and his team. Tune in today to learn all about these new hazelnut cultivars and how they may transform tree crops agriculture in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. Stick with us. Tom Molnar, tell us about your personal background and how you became interested in plants. Well, when I was younger, I I was sure that I wanted to be a scientist uh, ever since I was probably six or seven years old. Um, that was my desire. And of course, I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew I loved science and biology when I was a little kid. And uh, I really wanted to just work in science. And um, I grew up really, uh, I grew up in uh, central Pennsylvania, north central Pennsylvania, at least in my formative years. And I spent a lot of time in the forests and I just really loved biology. Um, but I was more interested in maybe animal biology uh, at the time. So when I went to college, uh, I just thought, well, I'll work in science and I'll probably work with something related to like wildlife biology, uh, you know, sort of related to forestry, but ecology, but not not thinking about plants. But then I started to take classes and I started to realize like I really loved the idea of doing research. Probably it was in just the second semester of college, still my freshman year, I realized like if I'm going to do research with animals, it's probably going to go down a, a path that I really wasn't interested in doing, uh, you know, working with mice or lab mice or something like that. And, and around that time, I took a, a class, a really great class on plant biology, and the professors were great. And it really just opened my eyes to this whole area of, of research that could be done or just plants in general as a sort of scientific opportunity. And uh, I just got really excited over plants, started to think about a career in, in, in working in, in plant science, you know, never really thinking of that when I was younger. And I had one of my relatives work at Rutgers University in New Jersey, even though I was in at the time going to school in Western Pennsylvania. And I asked her if she could just get me a job with one of the professors who worked in plant science. And luckily, she had some connections and she was able to get me a summer job. And it happened to be with Dr. Reed Funk who was probably in his mid to late 60s at the time. And he had a, previously had a very successful career in breeding turf grasses, cool season turf grasses, like landscape turf, you know, sports field turf, and just had huge success in the area. Uh, but as he was getting older, he was getting more interested in food crops and sustainability and nutrition and um, decided when he was in his late 60s to start a new breeding program and that was right at the time when I started to work with him. So it came at just the right time to kind of work with this master plant breeder who was shifting gears from grasses to temperate nut trees. And then that just, once I learned that plant breeding was a, you know, a, a career path, I, I, I knew it, it, almost immediately it was, it was for me. And so was Dr. Funk working with a variety of different species or was it just primarily hazelnuts? Well, at the beginning, it was essentially every temperate nut species that you could that you could get your hands on. You know, I think he, he read J. Russell Smith's tree crops book, probably when he was much younger. He had a passion for like, especially black walnuts in uh, Persian or English walnuts. For the Rutgers program, we basically started collecting seeds and plant material of, of all the, the temperate nut species. So, you know, from black walnuts, Persian walnuts, heart nuts, pecans, chestnuts. We had several different species of pine nuts. We even had ginkgos was even on the list and of course hazelnuts and you know dr funk being a really sick like a knowledgeable plant breeder set his sites really wide so we were collecting plant materials from all over the world really at the beginning we didn't know what we were going to focus on essentially we were trying to say like what what could what would work best here let's try let's basically try everything how old were you again when you're traveling the world collecting all of these different nut species well i, I I was, was the first trip um, that I went on, I was 20, 22 years old, 22. I met Dr. Funk when I was 18, 18 turning 19 years old when I started to work for Dr. Funk. Early, the early years, we were collecting everything we could get from within the United States and Canada. 
Um, and it wasn't until like three or four years in that we started to actually go on our our foreign trips uh, where we would go collect seeds and bring them back. I should mention Dr. Funk, he was able to do this because of the success of the turf program. And he was actually generating through royalties from sale of seed from those many cultivars he developed quite a bit of revenue that came back to the university. So it's kind of unusual to, to have such a kind of expensive long-term project started at a university. He really had the, the ability to do that because of the, well, support from the university based on his previous successes, but also the revenue that came in and that gave him some flexibility with how we could support the project. And, and Tom, prior to this time, what was the state of hazelnut specifically? Were there just wild selections currently commercially available? Had there been breeding done before? Well, so there's two kind of two sides to it. There was starting in the early 1900s, there was some breeding where there was attempts or there they were some programs in place to cross our native hazelnut Corolla americana with the European hazelnut Corolla avalana. And it it was interesting, it was very focused. They found a American hazelnut that was named Rush, which maybe you're familiar with or some of the listeners would be familiar with. And that was used as one of the main parents. So they used Rush, which came from Pennsylvania, and they crossed it with you know, a small handful of European hazelnuts and started this interspecific hybrid breeding program. Um, and that was probably around 1920. And it, it continued into the 1940s and 1950s, but it was really limited in the parents that they used. So there's sort of a small scale breeding program in New York and, and partly with the USDA. On the other side was efforts in the Pacific Northwest well, a little bit later to select, you know, European hazelnuts, either cultivars already that were existing or uh, there was a lot of seedlings that were grown and selected to try to find cultivars, you know, suited for the, uh, you know, the Willamette Valley of Oregon, for example, or parts of Washington. Um, but there wasn't a lot of breeding early. And then when we picked up the project, we collaborated immediately with Oregon State University, uh, which already had been breeding hazelnuts for several decades. And then, of course, there were several private breeders, for example, the Grimo Nut Nursery, Ernie Grimo, and some of the other northern nut growers in sort of the Ontario and also New York, Buffalo, New York region. And then um, some of the work with Badger Set, making bigger and more interesting populations of hybrid hazelnuts from Minnesota, Wisconsin area. So when we started, we just tried to collect as much as we could from everyone and even the USDA collection and bring as much material as we possibly could back to New Jersey to see what would actually work here. So Tom, many of our listeners are probably familiar with hazelnuts to some degree and may be familiar with American hazelnuts they might may have some knowledge of Eastern filbert blight, but that EFB is kind of like the why to, to all of this research. So to just kind of put things in perspective, could we do a, a little bit of explanation of sort of the um, global hazelnut market and production and why EFB has limited that in areas of the United States historically? Sure. So, well, I guess if I can just take one step back, because Eastern filbert blight is actually, and it may seem a little silly, but Part of the reason we switched from all of these different nut species growing here at Rutgers to hazelnuts. So Eastern filbert blight is the main reason we, we do not or have commercial or say a sizable commercial hazelnut industry in the eastern half of the United States. Um, and Eastern filbert blight is a disease called by a fungus called Anisogramma anomala, which is in fact a native disease or a native pathogen, I should say, to the eastern half of the United States. It's typically found associated with our our wild American hazelnut. And it's it's evolved with the American hazelnut. So it doesn't necessarily kill our native species. It may cause a a stem canker or some stems to die, but typically the the wild species will live through it and continue to produce seeds and and sort of propagate itself. They've co-evolved together. But what that means is where wild American hazelnuts are native or grown, uh, there tends to be some eastern filbert blight around or the, the fungus that causes the eastern filbert blight disease. This disease is not found outside of North America. And when we look at the commercial hazelnut, that's European species, Corolla avalana. That's evolved it, not in the presence of this pathogen. 
and basically as a result, I would say 98 to 99% of all European hazelnuts are very susceptible, if not highly susceptible, to eastern filbert blight. While on the native hazelnut, eastern filbert blight causes small stem cankers, and it may you may lose a few stems or or canes of the you know the spreading shrub. On the European hazelnut, it's fatal for most European hazelnuts, uh, and it's it can act in sort of a devastating manner. Really, um, you can have a ten year old European hazelnut that's been growing free of disease. Uh, maybe there were no spores of the fungus around. And then once it gets infected within just a, just a couple years, the entire tree could be, be dead or now just sprouting from the base. So this n- natural fungus that, that we found in the Eastern United States has is, is been the main reason why we haven't been able to grow hazelnuts commercially. When I say hazelnuts, I mean the European hazelnuts. There are many zones or climatic regions in the Eastern United States where you can grow European nuts and you could grow them successfully. And we're, you know, we've been demonstrating some of that, but I've also visited other nut growers that have just sort of actively grown trees free of disease, or uh, there's not a lot of Eastern filbert blight if it's in a, you know, agricultural area with just corn and soybeans, for example. Um, and I've seen some really beautiful European hazelnuts, you know, 20 year old trees even. So it's, it's really this pathogen that's stood in the way of of growing the European hazelnut in, in a wide area of the Eastern United States. And the reason why American hazels aren't grown commercially, I presume, is just because of their size and the ratio of kernel to shell. The European ones are just larger nuts. Is that correct? That's that's probably one of the main things. Some of the American hazelnuts are very tiny. You know, For example, a decent sized European hazelnut could be a one gram kernel. Um, whereas you could have like a 0.2 or 0.3 gram kernel. Um, if you get up to 0.5, that's a really big wild hazelnut. And then on top of that, they have very thick shells. So if you're talking about harvestable yield, if it's such a small kernel and then only 30% of weight, you know, if it's 30% kernel by weight, there's more shell than there is kernel. They're just tiny. So it's you know, it's easy to gravitate towards the European hazelnut, but the tree architecture itself is also can be quite different. So a lot of the, I would say most until very recently, the commercial harvesting equipment is geared towards harvesting nuts that drop on the ground because most of the equipment was developed in Italy or Turkey, you know, unless in Oregon where they grow the European species. So not only are the nuts or kernels very small with the thick shells american hazelnut's very shrubby it's sort of a spreading plant and it's just harder to commercialize you know on top of having the tiny nuts um so it's it's kind of a combination of of the both uh, sides of it and is there are there any efforts to commercialize the pure uh, american uh, and and maybe maybe even intergress some 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 traits for larger uh, seeds or different uh, shaped trees or is it the case that it's just it'd be simpler to bring in the genes for the the efb resistance from the american into the european well there is some work up in the upper midwest especially in wisconsin university of wisconsin where they are looking at american hazelnut you know potentially commercializing it is just a pure species it's kind of nice to be able to look at one of our native species and look towards domesticating it for production. And I think there is opportunity there, but when you hybridize the American with the European, you have this opportunity to substantially increase the size of the kernels, then also select for some different plant architectures that could be you know, more easily harvested. You know, not to say that, so there is efforts now in place I mean, even in Oregon, um, to develop or to utilize harvesters that pick directly from the bush instead of from the ground, um, where the American hazelnut plant architecture might be, you know, even better suited. So it's possible, uh, but the opportunity breeding, um, since we've been doing it really since the 1920s, um, there's been a lot of improvements made in those hybrids between the two species where we have increased much greater uh, increased kernel size and sh- thinner shells and you know, some other traits that work better with, you know, one thing is just being some of the native species will have a heavy crop one year. You know, this is in general, a lot of our native species, w- one big crop like the oaks do, and then, you know, take a year off or take two years off. And some of the native hazelnuts tend to do that. You know, so breaking that sort of wild versus domesticated plant habit is, is important too. 
just to tag on to that that last one, and do the crosses work both ways where your pollen parent is the American in some cases and in other cases it's the the European, or is it mostly getting that EFB resistance of American into the European? Well, I mean, most of the time the crosses with using the wild species was to bring in traits for for disease resistance or disease tolerance and also increased cold hardiness. In the past, that that was really the direction. You know, we're trying to keep the improved nut traits from the European and some of the, maybe the commercial traits that we want beyond just the size and then get the disease resistance and cold hardy natives. So that's been one of the directions. Um, you know, we've now that we we know a lot more about eastern filbert plants in the European species, and that's been one of the one of the big projects we've been focused on here at Rutgers, but also at Oregon State. Uh, that gives us opportunity to use genes now from both species to try to create hybrids that would we, we hope have sort of bolstering both sides of it, you know, kernel and nut traits and also resistance from from both sides. So we're not always crossing resistant American times susceptible European. You know, we have we have much better options now in, in these breeding efforts. Wow, that sounds promising. You know, one one of the thing is our native species, especially if you go into the northern range, is just very cold hardy. And some of them grow on soils that are very sandy. Uh, so they're just really tough, resilient plants uh, where the European isn't as cold hardy and is a little more, more sensitive to conditions like soil conditions, uh, water availability and you know temperature fluctuations. So the native really brings not just disease tolerance or resistance, but some resiliency there. So we're really interested in hybrids, not just for disease resistance, because I'll say like the inheritance of resistance from the native is is complex and you don't always get resistance in the you know, even one or two generations of, of breeding, but that nature of being resilient and adapted to these tougher climates does come through, you know, we'll say the first generation or second generation hybrids, or at least it appears to. So there's, there's, there's just definitely a lot of opportunity there with the hybrids between the two species. So Tom, I, I read an article that was released, I think in maybe 2021 or 2022, kind of diving into the various uh, different releases I have to say, I was pretty excited to see that, you know, uh, after what, 20, 30 years of, of this research, you know, now there are a handful of named cultivars that have been put out there. Like you said, they're selected for EFB resistance. I'd like to hear about each cultivar and sort of like, and listeners would as well, probably to sort of know which cultivars they might want to plant on their farm. But the pests are something that I think about a lot. I mean, every nut tree seems to have a lot of pest weevils and all sorts of things. I mean, Japanese beetles can affect hazels. I just learned uh, recently. Could we could we dive into that a little bit and maybe and then and then dive into the cultivars? Sure. The one thing I would say is our focus has been on eastern filbert plate resistance, yield, and kernel quality traits. I think, like in the region that we're growing hazelnuts, and it could be because there just hasn't been a lot of hazelnuts grown here for for a long time. We really have limited pest problems, you know, especially compared to, say, peaches or apples or vegetable crops. So just inherently, hazelnuts have less pest problems. There are places, say, in the upper Midwest where weevils, there's a specific weevil species that is native there that can impact impact hazelnuts. And then, of course, the Japanese beetles are, you know, fortunately not affecting the crop itself, but they do in the late summer, they can defoliate the plants. So if you have a really bad crop or bad year for Japanese beetles, they can impact the fitness of the trees, but they're not impacting the crop. Um, And for us here, we've seen a really significant decline in Japanese beetles. Brown marmory pink bug is another, that's a new pest. We've had it here since uh, 2010, and we've seen like the populations explode early and then really get reduced substantially. Um, They can impact hazelnuts. They also impact like dozens of other, you know, horticultural and agricultural crops. Um, But we haven't really been focused on, on selecting for pest resistance because we really have limited problems here. Even big bud mite, which is a problem in Ontario, I think even in upper Midwest, 
the Pacific Northwest definitely. Um, we have we have very low populations of that even. So we've really been focused on disease resistance, and then of course the yield in you know flavor traits of the kernels. Um, so I don't have a lot to offer or discuss in terms of like pest resistance, but um, in terms of the other things, I can I could talk a little bit more about it. Just a follow up question to that. Because the research is occurring in New Jersey, are these hazelnuts really for the mid-Atlantic region then? Or does it extend kind of into New England or in areas of the Northeast? Like how replicable do you think your results can be in other nearby areas? So the, the releases that we've had directly from Rutgers are pure European hazelnuts. And they were developed in collaboration with Oregon State. But they are pure European and selected here in New Jersey, which would represent the mid-Atlantic region. We really look at it as sort of the fruit belt region, which does extend into the Northeast. But it would be where the easy thing for me to, is to say, if you can grow peaches, then you could grow hazelnuts. And they're actually going to be a little bit more resilient or cold hardy than peaches. Um, but we, we try not to claim that these pure European hazelnuts are even suited for zone five. And I have growers that are growing them in zone five, but we're not, you know, that doesn't really represent where they've been selected. Um, so in certain parts of zone five, in those microclimates that are a little bit more protected, they seem to be doing okay. You know, and there's some caveats to that um, because pollen is probably the first limiting factor when you talk about hazelnuts or European hazelnuts. So these, these initial releases are primarily focused for the mid-Atlantic or the fruit belt growing region, which could even extend into parts of Michigan um, and then parts of sort of southern Ontario along the lakes. So it's it's those those sort of somewhat buffered regions. But we we have been working on hybrid hazelnuts, almost equally as long as the European hazelnuts, which we expect and we plan to test with a number of growers and other universities that they will be adapted to zone five and into zone four. But we can't really test for cold hardiness here in New Jersey. You know, we do have highly fluctuating temperatures with effect, which affects catkins. So we can select for those with, we would say more cold hardy catkins, but that's sort of reflected on, well, um, you know, you have a warm spell followed by a cold spell followed by a warm spell and you see your catkins would die, which is where your pollen comes from. And if you don't have what we call cold hardy catkins, then you're not going to really get good crops. If that sort of explains it a little bit from the, at least the releases, there's four releases that are pure European. And then there's the one that we affectionately call the beast, which is a hybrid hazelnut. We would roughly say it's 25% American hazelnut, which it does appear to ha be a little bit more cold hardy, but I still would just say, you know, that's a zone six, zone seven plant or grow it in zone five, but I'm not going to, you know, really stand behind its, its testing for that region. Until we, we, we get more information from our a bunch of our test growers out there testing these plants. Gotcha. Yeah, my mistake. I For some reason, I thought that Raritan and Somerset Monmouth, in my head, I thought those were all hybrids. But I'm looking at the, the information right now in front of me, and it does not claim that. <laughs> and, and you're not you're not alone. And I, I didn't really talk in, about my germplasm collections and, like, say, the former Soviet Union. And I've done a lot of collecting in colder regions. But the long-term nature of plant breeding, those materials are still in the pipeline. You know, we've done one generation, we've made improvements, but they're not quite good enough. But these releases that we've made, say Raritan, for example, they have kernel qualities that are on par with any best, you know, European hazelnut. So what we really, we wanted to get the best material out that we could, and it took 20 years to get there, almost 20 years. But instead of waiting another six or seven years to get ones that might be a little bit more cold hard, we say, well, we have growers lined up in New Jersey that want to grow them all throughout southern Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, you know, into New York State. So we went with the bet we had. If you had an opportunity to, to look at the pictures of the nuts or the kernels, and um, of course, our growers are just starting to plant these trees now, but the kernel quality is, is, is right there with any European hazelnut. And if, if it was hybrid hazelnuts or some of the more cold hardy materials we're trying to work with in breeding, the quality is just not quite there yet. And the yields too, on top of it. And, and Tom, you mentioned the, the growers that you work with. Is there a, a, currently like a need for more growers to, to be testing these new releases? Like if there's people who are listening right now that have farms that want to get into not only growing hazelnuts, but maybe 
helping in their testing and development. Is that something that there's a need for right now? Well, so early on, say four or five years ago, we we did kind of make a call for what you could say was test growers. And, and that was before the plants were commercially available or were just starting to become available. So we tried to organize, I think we have about 15, maybe 20 now of growers that we, for some of them, we gave them plant material or we propagated it and made it available to them specifically. And we helped them design their farms and you know they share information uh, so we have a sort of small test grower group, uh, but now the plants, especially the ones we've released, are available from nurseries and they're being planted. And what we're asking is, especially from our nurseries that are selling the trees, is ask those growers if they want to be part of our network where they share their information and then we can communicate and kind of give them surveys or polls and, and see what are they growing, how is it doing, uh, but that's less formal. We don't have you know, we're not it, early on. We even had some grant funding to to pay for some of the plant material and, and distribute. But now we don't really have anything in place like that. So I know growers get excited, and we have so many people so they're so generous to say, "Well, we'll we'll put in an acre of these trees, and we'll take great care of them, and we re- report back to you." But we don't really have anything. We don't have enough funding now to kind of organize that. But we do love to keep in touch with our growers, and I, I think we have about four hundred people on our hazelnut growers or prospective growers list. We try to send out semi-regular newsletters and, and contact the list for when we have upcoming meetings and things like that. Uh, so if any any listeners are out there that are interested in growing hazelnuts, please contact me by email and we can add you to the list and then you know we can keep in touch that way. Sort of on that topic of folks who want to grow hazels on their land, can we talk about some of the sort of tips and tricks of growing and managing hazels in a large, let's say like a medium to large system? I've read that they've been in some cases pruned to be single stemmed instead of the normal normal like multi-stem shrubs. I also have read that fertilizer is sometimes needed. Those are two things I wouldn't have known um, or I wouldn't have assumed. So yeah, there's a lot of things I don't know about hazelnuts. Okay. Well, I think this probably applies to any of the nut trees or most of the nut trees. What I always want to tell my growers or potential growers is the first thing to consider are your soils. Hazelnuts, just like chestnuts, uh, really don't do well in poorly drained soils. So if, if people are getting interested and they don't really have an agricultural or horticultural background, then it's really important to, to look at your soils or don't go by a farm without getting the soils assessed to understand like, what, what the potentials are. Because hazelnuts do need a reasonably well-drained soil. They'll do better with, say, a deeper topsoil profile and the soil organic matter content that's you know not near zero if it was a field that was just spanned with the corn and soybeans for 50 years. So I, I always ask the growers to like look at the soils and then get a soil test. And if they're working with us, then we can look at that and say, well, what's the pH? Because we would you know hope to increase the pH to over 6, so even up to 6.5 to just get better, uh, have better availability of the, the nutrients that are there. And then consider what type of style hazelnuts they want to grow. In the mid-Atlantic region, we like to really point our growers to what's been going on in Oregon. Now, we wouldn't do exactly what they're doing there. Um, they have no rains during the summer. So like historically, they've done very like clean cultivation. They have bare soil exposed between the trees. And you know we couldn't really do that. We would have just way too much erosion here. But in Oregon, uh, with the European hazelnut production, they do prune them to single stems and grow them as, as trees. While it does take some inputs because you're now cutting those suckers that come up from the base and taking a shrub and really forcing it into a tree form, um, but it really does make harvesting and managing those trees uh, much more efficient. Instead of the trees getting wider and wider at the base, um, you know, these are trees that you're harvesting the nuts from the ground. So if you have a wide crown, you're going to lose nuts into the crown. It's going to be harder to kind of blow them into windrows to vacuum them up or sweep them up, whatever method you want to harvest them. Um, so I do think it's important for growers to kind of do their homework. Because if you're going to grow, say, the upper Midwest style of hybrid hazelnuts, and that's a different system. And that's a new system. Um, I like the fact that we work on European hazelnuts because I can point to what's going on in Oregon what's going on in Italy um, and other parts. Uh, you know, there's really advanced hazelnut growing in France. Um, so we can model after that and pick and choose what we want. If you grow the hybrid hazelnut model that's being done in the upper Midwest, 
they're really kind of putting that together right now. But those trees would be grown as multi-stem shrubs in hedgerows with complete kind of green cover through the alleyways. And you'd have this really, you know, once the systems are up and running and I'll say they have the right plant materials available, um, you have this really nice resilient system. Um, and then you're going to harvest over the top of the bushes with a machine that's like a blueberry picker. Um, but for our model of trees in the mid-Atlantic, say Raritan, for example, is a is actually a very large shrub, but you would prune it into a tree or actually prune it. You can let it grow and have like, say, five or seven main trunks, but they're sizable trunks. They're not thin canes like you have in the American hazelnut. Um, and then each year you're, you'll remove the suckers because for one, those suckers actually take two years before they produce nuts. So then you have all this competition with this flush of growth. So, you know, our growers here in New Jersey or in the Mid-Atlantic would typically be growing them as single stem or just reduced stems and then suckering them, you know, yearly to kind of keep this tree-like growth habit that facilitates harvest. Now, I think that would be step one to kind of decide what type of system, because I imagine a lot of your listeners may be in the more colder regions and the options right now are the hybrid hazelnuts. Uh, so you'd really want to look into the the models that they're developing for, you know, the hybrid hazelnut systems. Whereas if you're in the, say, zone six and zone seven and looking at pure European as your production style, you could still mimic those. But also we could really, what, what we're recommending is looking at what Oregon's doing, but then also bringing in grass cover or some sort of green cover for all of your roadways and alleyways and, and managing it in a way that prevents erosion under our you know torrential downpours we have in the summer, things like that. So are there any precedents out there of folks who are integrating either hybrid hazels or the EFB resistant avalana species in polyculture agroforestry systems, perhaps in combination with perennial grains, or is all this research just too new for that to have already happened? You know, it, it seems that it's it's just so new. If anything's getting started, at least that from that I'm aware of, it's it's very new. I mean, the opportunities are, I think, they're very significant, um, especially in the early years of you know orchard establishment. Um, but I I can't really point you to you know too many ac- actual projects underway um, unless I know some growers that are experimenting with various annual crops between the tree rows as the trees are young especially so the European hazelnuts from our program have only been out for a few years and and then in the upper midwest now there's a history for a, now of seedling hazelnut hybrid hazelnut production and I think there's been some experimentation with multi-cropping. Um, but those seedlings, uh, at least from what I've seen, the, the yields haven't been really that significant. Uh, whereas the new clonal material that's being selected in the upper Midwest would have much higher yields and, and I think uh, kind of give you a little bit more robust of a system to experiment with. So I, I think it's kind of all starting to happen right now as plant material available. And even the hybrid hazelnut clonal material is still very limited. There's just challenges with propagation of that material. You know, the clones are really where, you know, you can take advantage of those uh, high yielding, very productive individual plants. You know, when you're going back to germinating seed and growing out populations from seed, um, you can still find those really high performing individuals, but on average, uh, the yields tend to be much lower than what's possible. So I think that's, you know, we're transitioning out of a, a phase of seedling hybrid hazelnuts for those colder regions to clonal material, you know, maybe in combination with seedlings, um, you know, for increased pollination and, um, you know, a little more diversity. But we're, we're sort of in transition in the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic. You know, the, most of ours only planted their trees last year or the year before. Um, there's some of the earlier ones that got some of the first plant materials getting into year three and year four, but uh, you know there's there's fifty or sixty or it's not a hundred acres of trees that are now just two year old trees. Um, so I think the growers are focused on just really trying to get their hands around hazelnuts, and then I with the thoughts of bringing in some of the other options with the perennial crops. Gotcha. Yeah, it's still very embryonic, I guess. So I have one question. 
I read in Bill Rudder's Growing Hybrid Hazel Hazel's book, which came out a, a while ago, I think in like the 2010s. In the, at the end of the book, he talks about this climate change resilience idea, how hazels can make a crop with energy stored from previous growing seasons. And I thought that was pretty wild. Is, is, the, is that something that is backed by, by science? Is that something that you guys have found in your research? Well, I think as a general concept, it's it's pretty sound. There's even fertility studies with even apple trees and other tree crops, almonds, even in mulching studies too. I've read a number of them where the treatments that you give a plant, a, a tree this year, you may not see the impacts of for two or three years. So there's this, I really like that mindset of, of thinking towards the future and building the resources in those trees to handle future years crops. We've seen hazelnuts have these really incredible yields in years that shouldn't support those crops. And I think they just build up such a abundant, you know, nutrient storehouse in the root systems and in the in the woody tissues that they're able to then sort of recycle that or use that over multiple seasons. I think it does apply across many different tree species and, and something sort of untapped maybe and and harder to study uh, scientifically you know versus you know maybe nutrient fluxes and different isotopes of different fertilizers you might use and then you can track them over multiple years but it it does seem to hold true um, although I can't point you to a study that you know would really necessarily outline it but I think I think Phil was really he, he is just a visionary and thinking about you know the bigger picture and you know, if if more people were thinking about that ability of tree crops and hazelnuts of being one, you know, of course, one I'm biased towards, um, but to have the capacity to get you through some rough years through the storage and the energy within those plants, it, it would do us all good to think that way, I think. I don't know if hazelnuts are, are similar to, to black walnuts, but I, I remember hearing from the other scientists in the lab I was working in that during the fall and, and early winter, uh, well, really by the end of the summer, uh, as the trees are putting on their buds for the following year, within those buds contains all the information for the, the growth that's going to happen the following spring. So if the if the tree thinks that it has enough fertility to support a nice crop for the following spring, it's going to create a bud that has a lot of flowering shoots. And then maybe if it, if it doesn't, it's more vegetative. Um, and so it's just going to be putting on vegetative growth and kind of biding its time until until a better season. I don't know necessarily if it's a, if it's a bad spring, if there's if it's dry spring or poor nutrients in the soil, how it could support a big crop after that, you know, after it's already decided it's going to put one on, but at least there does seem to be in that species sort of a delay where, or almost like a premonition where it's trying to guess what the conditions are going to be like for the following season and, and put on a good crop for it. Yeah. I, I, I think that's reflected a bit in hazelnuts too. They start setting their catkins, for example, in you can start to see the immature catkins in the middle of the summer, uh, which are for next year's crop. And if if those trees are impacted during that stage, it will change, you know, the partitioning from those floral buds to just vegetative buds, or you know, stopping growth altogether. Um, so it's it is I think for growers that were maybe used to annual crops. There is a, a learning curve, and you know we're finding with hazelnuts. If, in fact, we can keep them well irrigated through this sort of a few week period, and maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's a four to six week period in the summer. We can even out cropping more so than if if when I say cropping, I mean like biannual bearing, like a heavy crop versus a light crop versus a heavy crop. You know, if we can manage fertility and irrigation to where the plants aren't undergoing stresses um, especially during that summer then they will set more flower especially the european hazelnut i'd like to always kind of go back to like it's a domesticated tree crop at least much more so than the wild american hazelnut you know we found if we just treat the american hazelnuts just a little bit wrong then they they go they shut down they say well we're done we're done growing till next year we're just going to sit tight and survive uh, where the europeans it's we have trees 20 years old that have cropped more. They've have a higher yield than they did the year before and the year before that. And they're just kind of, if we keep them happy with balanced fertility, pruning helps, you know, managing sunlight, 
into the flower buds and then we've been moving into irrigating not all year round but just during specific dry times in the summer um, and seeing really a, a significant response in, in the plants you know to that permitted irrigation even in our eastern region here. So Tom I'd, I'd like to just pop back to that sort of climate change resilience idea maybe as sort of a, a wrapping up topic for the for this episode. One thing that kind of freaked me out this past season in, in New England, a uh, chestnut farm that I really like called Big River Chestnuts in Sunderland, Massachusetts, had basically a complete crop failure from a late spring frost on uh, May 18th. And this frost affected just tons of orchards and nurseries in the Northeast. And one of these things, you know, the whole idea behind tree crops is that they're more resilient and they're more resilient than annuals for, you know, a multitude of reasons. But this example really kind of made me question that. And with hazelnuts, one thing that they have going for them is my, my understanding is that the, the flowers are kind of botanically unique and they can survive really, really low temperatures, like negative 20 or negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you think that hazelnuts or hybrid hazelnuts, I guess we're talking about here, we're not talking about Avalana, but do you think that hazelnuts have a sort of climate change resilience baked into them, maybe more than other tree crops, or is that going too far? What do you think? Well, there's a, there's a couple of things I can kind of discuss there. We've had, so over the past, say, 10 years or so, we grow peaches where we grow hazelnuts and we also grow apricots. You know, of course, apricots are a little fickle. Um, they do suffer from every few years having a late spring frost, which will kill the flowers. Peaches typically don't unless you have one of those really late damaging frosts. So we've had multiple years now where we've lost the peach crop and we haven't lost hazelnut. We have not even seen an impact on the hazelnut. And this is European hazelnut and hybrid hazelnuts. And there's been times when the apple crop has been damaged and we haven't seen damage on the hazelnuts, probably because of their, you know, they do have cold, hardy flowers, especially the female flowers. So we've seen in my own time here, we've seen seasons where, you know, we've lost those tree fruit species, um, yet the hazelnuts have, have set a crop. So for me, that's, that's, that's a little bit of a, you know, a, some insight into like, well, they're a little bit more resilient or they're more resilient than those species. We've been actually studying a couple components related to flowering and that's accumulation of cold to be chilling. And then, then once chilling is met, now your flowers can break dormancy, but until they actually start to move and break dormancy or even your vegetative buds, there's a warm period that needs. So you need to accumulate warmth after you've accumulated your cold What's really been interesting is we found that there's huge variation in the plant material, even European, but definitely in American hazelnut, uh, where some plants need a high amount of chilling. But then once they get all of their chilling, it only takes a little bit of warm temperature and those flowers respond. And then, um, you know, in some years, they're going to be predisposed to getting damaged. But we found also some, some plants within the, you say, even American hazelnuts or European that maybe they don't need as much chilling, but they need a ton of warm temperatures before those flowers will start to move. Um, so there's two strategies there. And like, for example, you can go to Minnesota and there'll be wild hazelnuts there. You know, they may have a huge window of, you know, they need a lot of chilling to get through the winter. But as soon as it gets warm, they, they'll break dormancy and go right away. You know, this crazy climate that we're having now, when you have, um, I even think this year in the upper Midwest, it's very warm. Warm being now, like I should say, chilling is only accumulated when it's above freezing. So if you have 40 degrees, you're accumulating hours and hours of chill. If that happens too early, and then now you get a warm spell of three days of 50 degrees, and then it drops down to negative 10 next week, then you're going to lose your, your flowers. Um, but some of those plants actually need a lot more warm temperature after they re receive their chilling. Um, and so we're finding within hazelnuts and, and sort of like our breeding strategy for resilience is, is to search out those ones that need a lot of warmth after chilling is met 
and then cross those with that need a lot of chilling to begin with. And then, you know, we'll have these dual strategies that we basically just put bloom to a much later period and hopefully get us out of those windows of, you know, crazy temperature fluctuations where it does go down to like, you know, negative 10 after a, you know, a week of 50 or 60 degrees. Um, so I think there's opportunities there that they're more resilient than a lot of other species. You know, you, you talk about chestnuts, but maybe, you know, they're Chinese or hybrid chestnuts that aren't necessarily uh, adapted to the crazy fluctuating temperatures and that we could have here. But if we go to our American hazelnut, that's evolved under um, some of this maybe, you know, o- over over time, of course, um, I, I do think there's a bit of extra resiliency. Um, but if you pick the wrong plant material, you know, the strategies behind it, we could get burned also. If chilling is met really early and then we have a warm spell, when those flowers break dormancy and start to grow, that's when they're more susceptible to cold damage. There's a lot to still be figured out there. But we're, we've got a crop that I think could, could really be useful as, as we try to deal with what I look at is this crazy fluctuating climate now that we have to deal with, with a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, I think the, the highs and lows is really where, is where the future lies in terms of a crazy climate. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So where can people acquire the new Rutgers introductions and where can folks keep up with your work? In New Jersey, our main nursery is Foggy Bottom Tree Farm. Um, and they are all of the the Rutgers selections and also um, the Beast, which came out from our hybrid hazelnut consortium. And I believe Z's Nutty Ridge also is, is selling some of the Rutgers cultivars. I think they maybe even do like online sales foggy bottom i think has has gotten away from just like small retail maybe they're more wholesale you know growers planting one or two acres of trees Um, and i've done some web searches and there are some other nurseries out there that are maybe they're buying from propagation nurseries and then selling them on so i think i think a web search could find i know i found raritan and some of the others were sold from burnt ridge nursery that's in oregon so if, if growers are just looking to get a small handful of trees um, I think there may be some nurseries like like kind of mail order type nurseries that are selling them now too. Um, but definitely if you're looking to grow one, two to 10 acres, I would reach out to Foggy Bottom Tree Farm. You can find them online. And it, especially if you're thinking about planting in 2020, reach out to them soon because I think they're still in their, potentially in their propagation phase planning for the year ahead. So there's opportunities to place sort of pre-orders. Because they have been selling out every year, you know the numbers available are still kind of limited compared to the, the demand. Um, so if a grower is like, well, some of them are jumping in and say, I want to plant, you know, five acres of trees, and so then you know we're getting into the thousands of trees at that point. Gotcha. And what about you? If folks want to get in touch with you or learn about or keep up with your research, the easiest way is at this point send me an email. Um, if you just search for Tom Molnar, Thomas Molnar at Rutgers University, you'll find my webpage and my email address and we'll add you to our contact list. I'll send whoever's interested a link to our previous newsletters and you'll be on the list to get the ones that come out in the future. And, and hopefully we'll have one here in the next like two to three weeks, kind of giving an update. And, and through that, we also, if we're having, we're hosting a meeting or a Zoom meeting, something like that, that list gets all the information that we have. If I can make a plug also, a plug for the Northern Nut Growers Association, their annual meeting. I make it a point to go to every year's annual meeting and then give a presentation on the progress of our breeding program or some other aspect of it. And I look forward to talking with people interested in hazelnuts there in person. So if, if anyone out there of your listeners is familiar or look up the Northern Nut Growers Association. I think their website is nutgrowing.org. Their meeting this year is in in Syracuse. That's right. If you have the opportunity, go attend the meeting. If not, it moves around to a new place every year. Um, and that I think a lot of us that work on hazelnuts really love to attend that. It's usually a lot of fun and it's informal. So opportunities to spend a lot of time talking to those that grow hazelnuts and you know, us that work on them, you know, from the research side too. Awesome. Tom, thank you so much. I learned quite a bit today um, and I'm sure our listeners did too. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for coming on, Tom. Listeners, if you stuck around this long, thank you and see you next time.